Hello everyone, welcome back to Dragon Age. I figured we would continue on talking to some people in camp. Let's talk yeah, your to formidable folk, our dwarf David. friend. Good to have you along on the road. Let's see if we can pass this persuade check. Oh, nothing so unusual and so interesting as you and your companions, I'm sure. Dwarven merchants are common enough on these roads, aren't they? Have you heard any rumors? It seems that some of the bands just won't accept Tyrn Loghain's orders. There's too much talk still of King Caelan's death and questions about what happened. Good. So you'd think with the dark spawn knocking on our doorstep, people would be more likely to stand together, wouldn't you? That's what I've heard on the road, anyhow. Take it for what it is. So, of yeah. Of course. Good fortune to you and yours. I like, Bye. I like this guy. I like this dwarf. Um... It is there. I want to say their build is a little strange, because it his arms look proportionally. Like they almost look like they're longer than they should be. I don't know, but uh, I'm no expert on dwarf anatomy, but um, I do want to point out again that it's so interesting. Like whatever's going on, like I'm I'm genuinely intrigued to see what uh, Logan's end game is. But uh, I would like to read something. Um, from the codex. Okay. <clears throat> I, I'm, I, I'm guessing this is something I got from that, uh, mage in, um, uh, Denerim. Uh, but this is a treatise, uh, a treatise on magic and politics by first enchanter Josephus. It's interesting, Josephus. It's a, um, uh, not a biblical name, but there was a very famous Jewish historian by the name of Flavius Josephus, who uh, you can you can like go on Amazon and you can find his works. Uh, Antiquities of the Jews is his most well known uh, history. But he was a, a Jewish general that, when the Romans had had enough of the rebellions going on in uh, what we would consider now uh, Israel, like like the Levant, uh, he. Uh, he was a Jewish general that, like, surrendered himself to the Romans and and pretty much offered to make himself valuable to them by recording a history of the events and everything. And kind of serving, I think he kind of served as a liaison to, uh, to the Romans to, like, you know, kind of be like, hey, this is what the Jews believe uh, and this is what's going on here. Okay, but anyway, uh, I read this in between episodes and I thought it was interesting, so... I wanted to talk about it on here. Despite the loyalists' gra uh, grasp on the mage's political community, many libertarians and aqui uh, aqu aquitarians, aquitarians have begun to see eye to eye with respect to the Chantry's role in a mage's daily life. A growing number of mages, particularly those whose magic never strays from the Maker's mandate, feel that the Chantry's constant oversight is a burden upon their creativity and their very will, and one that hinders their ability to do their work. These mages, along with a number of hedge wizards uh, who work their arts outside the Chantry's influence, have formed a shadow guild of sorts, a mages collective wherein members can submit requests and have them seen to without judgment. This collective manages to work in, a rel in relative secrecy, their members discreet and their clients anonymous. As of yet, this collective has seen no sanction from the Templars, and there has been no sign that its members are practicing magic of which the Maker would not approve. Still, practicing magic outside of the influence of the Chantry is a dream for some and a dangerous notion for others, and many believe that it is only a matter of time before the Veil of Sorcery Sorry, the veil of secrecy is lifted and the mage's collective is brought to swift and brutal justice. You see, there's a little... At least for me on my screen, it, it, I, I kind of misread that. Uh, but a couple of things I want to address. It's interesting that, politically speaking here, it identifies libertarians and equitarians. Uh, of course, libertarians, like, if we want to get away from, like, the American definition of of that term libertarians would be those who are concerned with liberty like individual liberty and uh and everything aquitarians i don't know that i've ever heard someone uh refer to that in 
like normal political discussions. I, I have a degree in political and legal studies, and I don't think I've ever came across a term like this. There's the term egalitarians, uh, or egalitarianism, uh, but uh, equitas is, I'm probably butchering it because my Latin's not very good, but uh, equitas is, is equity. Uh, it's how you would translate that into English. So, uh, those who believe in liberty versus those who believe in equity. Uh, I don't really feel like explaining equity, but equity is a separate concept from uh, equality uh, that's definitely worth uh, investigating on your own time. But anyway, uh, so, you know, those who are invested in uh in equity and those who are invested in uh, in liberty are seeing eye to eye with respect to the church's relationship to mages. So this is something I talked about before that I'm, I'm interested to see uh, where this goes as far as the lore of the, like, they talk about uh, this, this uh, excerpt from this treatise talks about magic that the maker approves of versus that he disapproves of uh you know we can infer from that like blood magic is not something that the maker approves of uh, when you see the the templar's reaction to that uh you have, we in the last episode we see alistair's reaction to what happened involving the blood magic sacrifice of functionally like his stepmother okay so uh there's, there seems to be a relationship between magic and the church that, to me, kind of parallels how we understand the relationship between the church and science uh, in centuries past. I mean, like, far in the past, not currently. Uh, I do, I'm not well studied enough. I do not know enough. Uh, my... Uh, Secondary focus in university was in history, and I'm a very firm believer that I, I do not speak uh, with authority of something that I have not myself spent time with the primary sources or at least some secondary sources. But there seems to be this perception among a lot of people uh, in, in like popular history that the church for a long time, uh, like the Catholic church, was pushing... Uh, was was hindering the progress of science and that you know it basically like this the very uh, absurdist point of view would be like that, that that they viewed it as like it was just witchcraft you know thomas edison was a witch but uh that they seem to view it with this disdain and i don't know how much truth there is to that i i feel like it's probably more the case that a lot of the primary scientists of those times were believers. Uh, I feel like the the kind of dichotomy of that doesn't really occur until you get into like rationalist thought and you get into uh, enlightenment thought, where you start to see this this divide. This and that's that's what uh, Friedrich Nietzsche was talking about when when he said that God was dead. Like you see where like. People had, like, moved on. You know, they, they said, we don't need that anymore. Um, but, like, take uh, Newton, for example. Newton, you know, noted for, uh, like, his invention of calculus, or his development of calculus. I want to say that calculus predates Newton, but he's, he's really, like, foundational to it. Uh, Newton also believed that there was a secret code in the Bible... And he was like very dedicated to figuring that out. Uh, you know, he was he was not an he was not a atheistic person that hated the Bible. Uh, it was it was something of value to him. And uh, but I I can't help but wonder if in the world of Dragon Age, if there's that similar relationship where proper and good mages are people who I, I'm using that like with emphasis are people who believe that their magic comes from the maker and they want to please the maker through the use of their magic 
and they do not want to stray into like darker magics that the maker doesn't approve of. Whereas some are more uh, rationalist or enlightened in their thinking, where they understand that. Uh, or in their understanding, magic is it's of natural origins. Because, like, even in our reality, uh, natural, like the natural order of things, is something you can believe in, whether you are a believer in a god or if you are not a believer. It's it's something that that both parties can believe in. And I think this treatise is kind of hinting at that of like, there's these mages that, you know, it's not that they hate the maker, but that they very simply are, you know, they just want to practice magic freely without the, uh, the church dictating what they can and cannot do. Uh, like it mentions, uh, this treatise here mentions, uh, a burden upon their create, uh, creativity and their very will hinders their ability to do work. Uh, when when it's so controlled like that, it is hard for them to innovate. It's hard for them to advance their magic. And I think that is very interesting. Um, and I, I think, in a way... Um, how to put this into words? In a way... These these mages are not rejecting the maker. They are just trying to advance what they are, uh, and and separate. Uh, the best way to kind of relate it is they want to separate themselves. Like they they want the religious freedom to practice magic without the church dictating what they can and cannot do. That is super interesting. Uh, hey, we have a section on magic and religion. Uh, let's see. Apostates. Okay, it's not uncommon for the neophyte to mistake apostates and maleficarum as one and the same. Okay, so the this term maleficarum comes up again. Uh, we have a quest to hunt down a maleficarum or a group of maleficarum uh, I guess ma Maleficarum may be plural. Like I said, my Latin's not very good, but um, but Male here, Male is bad. Like very simply, Male means bad. Uh, like you can you can see like a relationship between that and the word like malfeasance or uh, malicious is a much more common English word. But um, uh, but Maleficarum are, I, I'm going to kind of take a guess here, uh, apostates are people like Morgan who live outside of, like, they are not registered mages. And then the Maleficarum are dark mages. Uh, they are bad users of magic. Okay, uh, it's one, uh, one of the same. Indeed, the Chantry has gone to great lengths over the centuries to establish that this is so. The truth, however, is that while an apostate is often a Maleficar, it need not be so. A Maleficar is a mage who employs forbidden knowledge such as blood magic and the summoning of demons, whereas an apostate is merely any mage who does not fall under the auspices of the Circle of Magi, and therefore the Chantry. They are hunted by the Templars, and quite often they are they uh, quite often will turn to forbidden knowledge in order to survive, but it would be a lie to say that all apostates begin that way. Historically, apostates became such in one of two ways. They are either mages who have escaped from the circle uh, or mages who were never part of it to begin with. This latter, uh, I'm sorry. this latter category includes what we tend to refer to as hedge mages, those with magical ability out uh, in the hinterlands who follow a different magical tradition than our own. Some of these hedge mages are not even aware of their nature, underdeveloped, their abilities can express themselves in a variety of ways, which the hedge mage might attribute to faith or will or to another being entirely, depending on his nature. Some of these traditions are passed down from generation to generation, as with the so-called witches of the chastened, wi uh, chastened wilders, or the shamans of the Avar barbarians. No matter how a mage has become an apostate, the Chantry treats them alike. 
Templars begin a systematic hunt to bring the apostate to justice. In almost all cases, justice is execution. If there is some overriding reason the maid should live, the right of tran uh, tranquility is employed instead. Whether we of the Circle of Magi, 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 believe this system fair is irrelevant, it is what it is. I don't like that last line of acceptance. Just It's just how things are. Uh, it's the status quo. But this is interesting. It goes back to what I was saying. This relationship between the church and the mages. Uh, you see, like, the Templars, that, that name is very intentional. Uh, these are knights in service of the church who are hunting down people they believe to be apostates. You know, I'm not saying that's what, like, the Knights Templar did in, in history, but, like, they are agents of the church that are, it's very much, and like, an Inquisition type thing. I don't know how that relates to Dragon Age Inquisition, but uh, we'll see that as we go on. If I really enjoy this game, I will, I'm not making any promises, but I will most likely look at Dragon Age 2, excuse me, and Dragon Age Inquisition. I'm definitely... Definitely interested in playing this series now that I've put this much time into it. Let's see. Okay, this is uh, this is kind of a long poem about the maker. I'll read that some other time. And that is about the Fade. Okay, but speaking of mages, let's talk to our favorite witch. Let's see what Morgan has to say. What do you wish of me? Let's talk about you. We are in camp, so tis as good a time as any. Tis as good a time as any. I don't... No, I don't want to do that. I feel like maybe we have to get to a certain point with Morgan to get a more positive... What do you wish of me? Uh, ...outcome to it that conversation. Cannot. Let's ask her about her mother. <laughs> well, that depends, does it not? What does she seem to be? Okay, I like how kooky Flemeth seems when we meet her earlier in the game, but I like how Morrigan kind of shares that a little bit with, you know, this particular line of dialogue. Interesting that we can ask if she's human. Oh, she certainly was human once. Tell me, how much do you know of the tale? The one that the Chastens still tell of my mother, to frighten them into obedience. I've heard a little of it. No doubt such a tale has mutated much over time and telling. As they do. I can relay what Flemeth once told me herself, and you can decide whether or not tis the truth, if you desire. That sounds interesting. As the tale is sung by the bards. There was a time when Flemeth was young and beautiful. A fair lass in a land of barbarian men. The desire of any who saw her. Many centuries before this land was even named Ferelden. The tales say that Flemeth fell in love with Osin the Bard and fled the castle of her husband, the dread Lord Conobar, and that he swore vengeance for her infidelity. In truth, my mother claims that t'was Osun who was her husband, and Conobar the jealous Lord who looked on from afar. Lord Conobar approached young Osun and offered him wealth and power in exchange for his lovely wife, and Osun agreed. The life of a bard is a poor one, and love fades in the wake of hunger. It was Flemeth who suggested the arrangement. Hmm. All would have been well had Lord Conobar kept his end of the bargain. But he was a uh. foul man who bargained with coin he did not possess. Osun was led off to a field and slain, left for dead. Flemeth spoke to the spirits and learned of the deed, and swore revenge. That was not the point. Conobar had no honor, so she would not have him. Flemeth begged the spirits to aid her, 
and twas they who slew Conobar. The demon the legend tells of came later. Lord Conobar's allies chased Flemeth, you see. Chased her to the wilds, and there she hid. There she found the demon, and he made her strong. The legends all speak of the great hero Cormac, he who defeated Flemeth and her great army when she invaded the lowlands centuries later. All lies. Hmm. I kind of like the dialogue options that I can pick that relate to my background. So I think we're going to go with that. The truth of the matter is that there was never an invasion. As Flemeth tells it, the Chastened never raised an army under her banner, and she never fought with any warrior named Cormac. Cormac led a brutal civil war against his own people, and later claimed it was to vanquish evil that had taken root amongst the lords. Thus, he was hailed a hero. Flemeth was only attached to the legend much later. Perhaps it was due to the great war with the Chastened that eventually came, but Mother claims not to know how it began. That is really interesting. Um, let's say this. You ask if I have sisters. I have asked of this myself. The stories tell of many witches of the wilds, after all, not just the one. And these tales existed long before I did. Flemeth refuses to speak of other daughters, if they existed. So, should I believe I am her first? I doubt that, too. How is it that Flemeth have sur has survived this long? The demon within her has transformed her into... something else. An abomination, perhaps, some would say. I know not. I only know my mother is clever, and she is part of the wilds as it is part of her. But she is no immortal. She bleeds. A blade in her heart would kill her like any other, were it lucky enough to find her. Do you believe her version of the story? I do not believe everything that Flemeth claims. Oft it seems her bitterness has colored her memories. But on the whole, yes, I believe this tale, if not all. Flemeth tells it with far more embellishment than I, but you are welcome. Dare I ask of your own mother? Few are abominations of legend, tis true, but I find myself curious, nevertheless. <sighs> of course our character is an orphan. Uh, we, This was off screen, I think. I talked to the merchant in the, uh, like the elven village, I, I forget, the in the forest. Um... And he mentioned that he knew my father, and one of my dialogue options with him was something along the lines of, you know, how he died, like, so long ago that I, I don't really remember much of him. Uh, so, of course, our character's an orphan. Ah, oh, then you have my sympathies for what it is worth. Which is very little, I am certain. It matters not. Let us move on. Morrigan approves. See, that was actually really interesting story. Like, really intriguing lore on her mother. And we we got to have a good conversation with Morrigan. And we got to relate to her. And we got to see a little bit of her, her humanity. Also, like, let's look at what she's got going on over here. As far as her tent set up. I'm not quite sure what's going on with this. She appears to have, I guess, some alchemy stuff going on here. She's got a lot of, like, of deer hides, it seems. And she's got some, uh, some scrolls and stuff. You know, uh, it looks like some scales. So, you know, normal stuff for a mage, I would assume. And she has a absolutely roar, roaring fire, which should be setting these things right here on fire. Um, but yeah, also interesting little root texture here on the ground. That was really good. Like, like moments like that, moments like we had with Alistair earlier, 
That is exactly why I like games like this. Also, look at this wheel of cheese. Holy cow. Uh, I'm guessing... Well, I mean, she is right here next to it. This has got to be Liliana's tent. Because we see an instrument of sorts. I don't really see anything really that stands out about any of the others. Hey, let's... Uh, we haven't talked to the dog. What can we say to Thucydides? I once heard a really old legend about how the hound warriors in the days of the old tribes would feed their Mabari the flesh of the vanquished. Well, that's what I heard anyway. It would sometimes be human flesh. Oh, like you can tell the difference. For all you know, maybe you've already been fed something. Someone. He's a good boy. Like, he really, he really is a good boy. Also, I misread the first uh, dialogue option here and <laughs> thought it said, don't listen to him, Alistair. He's full of rubbish like I was talking about the dog. Uh... If you've had it and didn't know it, it was probably tasty. Uh, I'd never feed you another human being. It's not cannibalism if he's eating it, you know. <laughs> he's like, hold up now. That's some dark stuff I'm not down with. I like how we get, like, uh, let's see if we can trigger something else. Oh, look at what your <gasps> dog placed in my pack. He wags his tail. A putrid, half-eaten hair is not something a woman wants to find in her unmentionables. <laughs> I'm really glad that we were able to trigger a second dialogue with, with the dog. Uh, why doesn't he share his food with me? He obviously does mean well. He's... He's trying to take care of us. The dirty mongrel can have this back. There. And tell him not to do it again. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't want to be mean to Morgan. We're not going to be mean to her. Uh, you're a war dog, not a... <laughs> okay, I love the concept that this absolute... This absolute lad of a dog that we have is actually just a sweetheart trying to take care of everybody in the party. Uh, you heard the lady. Oh, poor puppy. I don't want it, you worthless fur bag. She does not like the pupper. This is sad. I think you hurt his feelings. Oh, he's just trying to be manipulative, I can tell. I do it too. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. I want to watch this. You are a true warrior and worthy of respect. <laughs> <laughs> this is incredible. Oh my goodness. Okay. Do we get one for Leliana? Oh, and now we're just talking to him. Uh, good boy. He's a good boy. I swear, if this dog digs up something. <laughs> what a good dog. What And what a great... What a great... Like, all of this. All of this was awesome. I, I'm guessing we don't get... Yeah. I'm gonna pet it. And we're gonna pet the dog. Oh, look at him. I'm sorry, that dog... That... Okay... He is like the cross between a pit bull and like, he's like a pit bull, uh, a boxer, and like an Abrams tank. 
he is an absolute just dog with like capital D, capital O, capital G. He is a dog. Okay, so we've, uh, I believe, we have healed up our injuries. Everybody looks good. We gave Alistair some new armor. Uh, we got some great dialogue and development with our characters. And uh, we, we had some... I, I hope you enjoyed the discussion about the... Uh, at least my thoughts currently on the Chantry and the Mages. Uh, I hope that makes sense, uh, sense to you. Uh, I, sp I spent a lot of time uh, reading theology, history, and philosophy when I was in university, so I it's it's kind of my wheelhouse, so I enjoy talking about it, uh, but I'm always open to different perspectives about it, so if you think I'm wrong, <laughs> if you think I'm kind of getting it wrong, uh, that's a discussion I'd, I'd like to have. So, uh, anyway, I think this is just going to be a little bit shorter of an episode. Uh, I'm really enjoying this game. This, all of this that's occurred in this episode and pretty much in uh, the end of the last episode, this makes up for my complaints about the combat. The game can have kind of subpar combat if the writing's going to be this good. Anyway, uh, I'm genuinely thankful that you've spent your time with me here and I look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Au revoir.